Welcome once again to the Radical Imagination. I'm your host, Jim Vretos, and I'm a sociologist and criminologist at John Jay College here in New York City. And we're here with you every Sunday evening at 8 p.m. on MNN, your Manhattan Neighborhood Network. And you can also see us again on MNN 4 every Thursday evening at 8 p.m. when the show is repeated. As we tape this show, the headlines around the country are acknowledging that campus protests at the University of Missouri in Columbia, Missouri, have spurred a day of change. And as the New York Times put it, an extraordinary coup for the demonstrators, resulting in the president and chancellor of the university stepping down after months of student and faculty protests over racial tensions and other issues at the university. But it was charges of persistent racism, particularly compliments of racial epithets hurled at the student body president, who is black, that sparked the strongest reactions, along with complaints that the administration did not take the problem seriously enough. Last week, the radical imagination had Stanley Nelson on, director of the new film Black Panthers, vanguard of the revolution. We discussed, along with community activist Felipe Luciano, the impact and challenges of the Panthers during the volatile 60s and 70s in the country. We were particularly interested in understanding the impact they had and might have on revitalizing a stronger and more progressive left in the country. Even more specifically, we were interested in exploring how the Panthers had provided a legacy for other black liberation struggles to develop. Black Lives Matter as an emerging movement is an example of that legacy, and we want to dialogue with them and how they might be responding to that history today. So this evening, we're extremely pleased to have on the show some of the most thoughtful spokesmen and activists for what is arguably the most significant black liberation movement since the Panthers. Before I welcome our guests this evening, I want to alert all of our viewers to what we have planned for the first part of the show. We want to show a series of seven short clips from the Panther documentary, and then have our guests respond to these clips and their possible impact on the Black Lives Matter movement today. Now these clips will consider, among other things, the mythic statuses and images of the Panthers, the changing gender roles within the party, the moments like the assassination of Bobby Hutton when the US government and FBI began to take the Panthers very seriously as a militant movement, the importance and crucial role of the weekly newspaper and Emory Douglas's drawings and animations. The importance of Fred Hampton as the possible black messiah and his subsequent assassination. The arrest and subsequent trial of the Panther 21. And finally, the emphasis on the recruitment of youth to the party and the physical character of the Panthers, the aesthetic aura of the Panthers, their use of the media to their cause and their advantage. A little over a year ago, the nation watched as the city of Ferguson erupted. While demonstrators took to the streets of Ferguson and cities like New York and LA, a new generation of activists gathered both on the ground and online. The Black Lives Matter movement called for change with how police deal with minorities and demanded a look at systematic racism and inequality. And from it emerged a group of young people paving the way. They perhaps represent a new vanguard in America's ongoing struggle to solve what the Swedish social scientist Gunnar Mordahl called an American dilemma. I'm thrilled and proud to introduce three of these young activists today on the radical imagination. Kosi Anderson is a PhD student at Union Theological Seminary and also a member of the National Steering Committee of Rise Up October. 
Carmen Dixon is an organizer of Black Lives Matter in New York, the New York chapter. And Robbie Thompson is a Master of Arts student at Union and also has participated in Rise of October. Welcome to you all and welcome to our audience. So before our discussion, we will have a series of short clips on the Panthers and we'll respond to that. The image that was mobilized to create the Free Huey movement gave Huey almost mythic status in the party. He had become an image and not a man, and that gave him power that ultimately proved dangerous. Come to the clinic tomorrow for an appointment. He came out focusing on returning to the survival program, the breakfast program, the free health clinics free food program and the sickle cell anemia research program. I remember Huey P. Newton saying, the Black Panther Party was not going to last. He said the organization was going to get destroyed based on the way we were. We were very aggressive and we kind of realized that this wasn't going to last long. Uh, we know those are not revolutionary programs. Uh, uh, they're at best survival programs. Uh, we know that uh, the people are in jeopardy of genocide, and that if they do not survive, then it won't be uh, possible to bring about revolution. We were um, really trying to connect more with the uh, people in the community, and this was a this was a, a, a big push, and there was probably some um, some people who were not happy. We have a breakfast for children program, you know. But that's not uh, what the Black Panther Party is all about, you see. I don't agree with saying that the Black Panther Party uh, supports breakfast for children, and that's all that we're about, you know. Don't talk about this other thing. The Black Panther Party is for overthrowing the United States government. Those people who were on the other side of this issue politically did not see the Black Panther Party as a vehicle for social service. We saw it as a vehicle for political transformation, radical change, for revolution. One of the ironies of the Black Panther Party is that the image is the black male with the jacket and the gun, but the reality is that the majority of the rank and file at, at, by the end of the 60s are women. Everybody knows that all the people don't have liberties, all the people don't have freedom, all the people don't have justice, and all the people don't have power, so that means none of us do. The Black Panther Party certainly had a chauvinist tone and so we tried to change some of the clear gender roles so that women had guns and men cooked breakfast for children did we overcome it of course we didn't as i like to say we didn't get these brothers from revolutionary heaven shot down like a common animal he died a warrior for black liberation. In the name of brotherhood and survival, remember Bobby. That could have been my son lying there. And I'm going to do as much as I can. I'm going to start right now to inform white people of what they don't know. For the Black Panther Party, it was crisis and chaos because this was the first time that this had ever happened. There had been no panther murdered by police. We want nonviolence, just like Martin Luther King. But nonviolence on the part of who? To sit and watch ourselves to be slaughtered like our brother? We must defend ourselves, as Malcolm X said, by any means necessary. For me, there was only one reason to read the Panther newspaper, and that was to see Emery's illustrations. His paintings, his caricatures, his illustrations literally gave us the story. Black as you, black as me, black as us, black as free, black as me, black as me, black as us, black as free, black as us, black as me, black as us, black as free, black as free. 
The community would respond to the artwork because it was a reflection of them in the artwork itself. Because you're putting them on the stage as the characters and the heroes in the images. They could see their brother or they could see their uncle in the images. Through the breakfast programs, through the other programs that we had, health clinics, you people come in and talk about how they can't pay their bills or they need child care. That teardrop symbolized that pain that I observed. Even through that pain, there was this strength and determination and conviction to still battle on. So I was trying to uh, put that into the artwork itself. Emory was our social realism. He gave you a sense of bravery, resilience, courage, and most of all, beauty. That was what I loved about Emory. We used to call uh, the Panther Party the vanguard of the movement because they were out in the forefront. They were kind of uh, uh, setting the pathway. Uh, the things that, uh, that we would face uh, some repression for, they would face it 10 times as, as great. They were uh, sacrificing their, oftentimes, their lives in the struggle. And these people in this class have divided themselves. They say, I'm black and I hate white people. I'm white and I hate black people. I'm Latin American and I hate heel business. I'm here, baby, I hate Indians. So we fight amongst each other. Fred Hampton here in Chicago was the main voice for racial unity. The Black Panther Party stood up and said that we don't care what anybody says. We don't think you fight fire with fire, bitch. We think you fight fire with water, bitch. We're going to fight racism, not racism, but we're going to fight with solidarity. We worked with organizations such as the Young Lords, a Puerto Rican street gang that had become political, and the Young Patriots, hillbillies, Appalachian white boys. I want to introduce a man who's come over tonight from another part of town, but he's fighting for some of the same causes we're to, uh, fighting for. Bob Lee, who was our uh, deputy field marshal, had a meeting with them, and he was explaining why we should work together. The police brutality up here, there's rats and roaches. The coalition that Fred was building in Chicago represented the Latinos, the poor whites, and poor blacks, but also because he had been in the NAACP, he had linkages with folks who were in the congregations or church folks and with working class folks. So Fred was building a broad-based coalition in Chicago, and that was the threat. In other cities, uh, the Panthers were under physical attack uh, from police departments. But New York City it was going to handle its Panther problem differently. They created a conspiracy case that allowed them to arrest the entire leadership of the New York uh, City Black Panther Party. A New York grand jury has indicted 21 alleged Black Panthers on charges of plotting several bombings in the city tomorrow. On April 2nd, 1969, in uh, pre-dawn raids, 21 Black Panthers were charged with all kinds of terrorist activity. These are some of the men the police are accusing of being involved in the plot which could have wounded or killed scores of busy New Yorkers. Twelve men were arrested today, two are already in jail, and seven more are still at large. And so the Panther 21 started. I had just turned 16 years old, but I had already become a section leader. When they first kicked in the door of my grandmother's house at 4 o'clock in the morning, I thought, while I'm important enough to be arrested, I'm a real Panther now. There was a feeling that it was a badge of honor. This was the most important place in the nation at that time for the party. It was spreading all over the East Coast, from New Haven, Baltimore, everywhere. It was spreading. I'm 
This brother here, myself, all of us were born with our hair like this, and we just wear it like this. Reason for it, you might say, is like a new awareness among black people that their own natural appearance, physical appearance, is beautiful. Black people are aware now. They're proud of it. It's pleasing to them. Dig it? Isn't it beautiful? All right. <laughs> about people who are teenagers, 17, 18, 19, 20. That's the bulk of the Panthers are teenagers. So the fact that we were so young and the fact that this hadn't happened before, I'm not certain that we recognize how startling it looked to other people. Dear Mr. Newton, I'm a 13-year-old black girl and I want to be a Black Panther. I wish you would fill me in. Does it matter what your religion is? What are some qualifications to be a Black Panther? P.S. Write me back personally. I was taught to be proper. Behave yourself. Um, you're going out in public to always know that the white man was listening. With the Black Panthers coming to the scene, it was just a completely different message. As a 12-year-old, you know, what? You had this whole other portrayal of self and just digging it. Photographers took advantage. I mean, they took our pictures, they put them on newspapers, they put them on magazines, and that look that we projected, you know, the big afro, the leather jacket, the shades, that became a hit. And obviously, photographers were drawn to the Panthers. Well, we hear a great deal about the Black Panthers. Black Panthers. Black Panthers. The Black Panthers. The Black Panthers were absolutely unique. The Black Panthers. The Black Panthers. Black Panthers. The Black Panther Party. Black Panther Movement. Black Panther Party. Black Panthers. I think the Black Panthers really understood the media. They knew what we were after. They they knew what we were focusing on. The Panthers has amounted to well, the Black Panther Party. Many people know of the Panthers. You might say that uh, we exploited the Black Panthers, but I think there's a lot of evidence that they they used us to their advantage. They were able to establish their legitimacy as a voice of protest. The chairman of the Black Panther Party, and here he is. So there we have several clips from the new movie by Samuel, uh, Stanley Nelson, Black Panthers, Vanguard to Revolution. Uh, there's so many possible questions we could ask you all. I, I think the best thing to do is to just have an open-ended uh, uh, response here. What did you take away from that? What, did, what first hit you? Uh, the legacy of the Panthers uh, for... Yes. Black Lives Matter today. Sure. Um, there, there was just so much. Um, yeah, yeah. And a couple of things that really resonated with me and some parallels that um, I can draw from uh, the Black Panther movement uh, for liber black liberation to today's uh, iteration of that same black liberation movement is uh, recognizing... So we hear Fred Hampton talking about um, fighting fire with fire fighting fire with water, not with fire. And so I think one of the, we've recognized that. So we've been able to learn from our elders and past movements. And one of the things that we're doing uh, is building a decentralized movement. Black Lives Matter uh, as a movement, as a network is decentralized. So you don't have one single often male um, sort of charismatic figure, you know, mm -hmm. running the show and, um, Obviously, this Black Lives Matter uh, movement, or the movement for black lives, as we also like to call it, uh, is being led by many black women, uh, queer, 
uh, cisgendered, which basically means that you were born, uh, you currently identify with the gender that you were born or assigned, uh, and also trans black women. Uh, these are folks who, who are leading today's movement, who you've not necessarily seen leading uh, in this way uh, in the past. So those are definitely, and you know, hearing from Kathleen Cleaver, uh, amazing, yeah. <laughs> yeah. What do you uh, take from it? <clears throat> yeah, I'm, I'm struck by kind of the way, the role that the white community can play. Interesting, um, In okay. terms of uh, what, what role they can play in the movement, right? And like, where does it start? So where does it start in terms of that kind of self-critical look at the role you're playing right now? And how can you be self-critical to a point where you can may possibly reorient yourself like being, Marlon Brando in the, in the clip there, right? Yeah, well, Coming like Marlon to, Brando, but I even think Marlon Brando needs to be more critical because Marlon okay. Brando's saying, my, it could be my son, right? Mm -hmm. But that's not the issue. The issue is not Marlon Brando, it's not your son, right? Yeah. So you need yeah. to be more critical of yourself to say, no, Mar like, no, Marlon, it's not my son, it's, you know. And so how can you stand in that moment and say that? That's tough. Sounds like Obama, too, making a similar sort of statement that could have been my son uh, it could yeah, have been Obama's been. son it could, it could and it could not yeah. have been because of the right. Secret Service protections that right. his son would right. have been right. afforded but if he were not the president um, it could have been his son um, or well, it, it, it people hate him so much as the president you know but with Brando you see I see at least a reluctance to step outside of his role as this like really strong white guy right like he can't say he couldn't say it, it could, it, he had to say it looked like my son. You know what I'm saying? Like he yeah. can't take that step back and be critical enough to say, this isn't about me, right? I gotta, I gotta, be, in behind, I gotta be behind these other people. Does that make any sense? It does, it does. It, Cozy, what do you it think? It certainly does yeah. Yeah. for me. I hear exactly what you're saying. Um, well, one, thanks for having us. Uh, oh, Jen. well, thank you all. Here with you all. She's so riveted really with the exciting. clips there. No, it's yeah. an honor to, to have you all here. Exactly. Absolutely. Uh, so, uh, for me, in reflecting on those clips, I mean, I think of the Black Panthers within the historical trajectory of, say, black nationalism, going back to Martin, going back to Blyden, uh, on up through people like Marcus Garvey leading, and I'm sorry, um, Martin Delaney and, 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 and uh, Edward Blyden. These are some of the originators of kind of black nationalism and kind of how that tradition stretches out throughout time to people like Marcus Garvey mm. and then people like the Nation of Islam through to someone like Malcolm X and then into the Panthers. And so black nationalism as a black political ideology, I mean, there are things we can critique about it, but some of its contributions to the black liberation struggle were a recognition and a promotion of the beauty of blackness. Okay, so we saw in that clip, we saw, um, you know, the sisters wearing the afros out and, you know, black people walking with pride. Um, the Panthers saw themselves as kind of the children of Malcolm. And that was one of Malcolm's great contributions to the black liberation struggle of saying, hey, you know what, I'm, you know, Afro-American, I'm black, I'm, I'm proud of that. At a time in which everything in society was saying that blacks don't matter. Um, and so that's fascinating for me, kind of seeing them along that ideological trajectory. So with the Panthers, what do we see? We see a promotion of blackness, black is beautiful. We see youth involved. We see um, kind of a energy. political energy, energy, a exactly, energy. exactly. Yeah. We see political engagement. Okay, the Panthers, I mean, Stirring they, they, they studied, they studied. Right. I mean, they, 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 they were reading, you know, their Marx, their Lenin. They were, you know, they were, they were, they were doing their studying. Um, we see them kind of thinking nationally, but also internationally. So drawing those connections. We see them uh, working within the community. So we have the breakfast program. We have, you know, uh, things that support the black community, but then also looking beyond race and connecting with the young patriots, connecting with the young lords. So we see all that. So I, I think that's just amazing, the work that they did. Fast forwarding to now, I see yeah, a lot yeah. of similarities in, in Black Lives Matter. Now, I do want to be um, you know, clear. Um, Black Lives Matter organi you know, originated um, by individuals you know, you know, in the wake of the Trayvon Martin um, you know, murder. 
and then kind of branched out. So on one hand, it's a, it's a movement, as like you said, with many different chapters, very similar to the Black Panthers Party. You know, which started out in Oakland and then kind of spread throughout the country. Um, exactly. Organization. But then it's also yes, a banner under right. which uh, people have come yeah. under uh, who believe that, hey, black lives do matter. Um, so again, we see kind of this promotion, this assertion of the beauty of and the importance and the value of black lives. We see uh, kind of a broad kind of um, not just uh, black folks involved, but, you know, bringing other folks in to help support. Um, I think you make a key point. I think in terms of um, one of the limits of black nationalism traditionally has been uh, kind of the patriarchal, um, even homophobic elements. And so I think what we're seeing with Black Lives Matter is, yes, kind of really a, a full uh, inclusion uh, taking place. Um, so I don't know. I'm, I'm talking yeah, a guess, lot, but yeah. Well, no, but, but what about that feeling that this wasn't going to last very long? There's this brief moment so this fatalism, right, Carmen, about the response of a system that was going to crush it. So it was almost an inevitability, uh, inevitability about it. Yeah. Do you think they felt that? Do, yeah. you, do you feel that in your movement today uh, as it emerges? I'm, I think we're still very early. Yeah. Um, this, this thing is just, like, launching off right now. Um, mm -hmm. And so I feel very hopeful. I do believe, you know, we often say on the streets, I believe that we will win. I actually believe that. Um, I do believe that we will win. Um, and I think that we can learn uh, from past movements, you know, um, take from that and, and build, build upon that and move forward um, with, like, strategies for, for how we can win. Um, but I... I I sort of recognize that, um, I mean, I'm hopeful. Um, I recognize that, that we're moving forward, but I think, so we're also calling this like fatalism, Afro-pessimism as well, uh, and recognizing that. The odds are pretty yeah. much against Yeah, the odds are stacked against sense, us, but I think but we're all here are also like people of faith. Um, and so for me, and probably both of you uh, sort of recognizing what's stacked against us uh, in, ter in terms of the faith <clears throat> tradition that we come from, but also like how we were able, the history of our people and how we have been able to overcome. Black people aren't even supposed to be here. So the fact that we are still here uh, is, a, is a testament um, that, that things will be moving forward, that things are moving forward. It's your face faith yeah. in life. Absolutely. And I actually believe that the phrase Black Lives Matter is actually, and I consider it an act of worship, uh, because we're, when we declare out in the streets that Black Lives Matter, we're just simply saying what God has already said about us, that our lives do matter. So... Well, that's a big difference from the Panthers, right? Yeah. I mean, there was not that influence of, of the faith uh, community, was it? I mean, they're a pretty secular uh, group of people that well, were involved. Well, you I, say? I think that with the Black Lives Matter movement, there are a number of... Black Lives Matter movement is different, right? Yeah. Well, well I don't know. Mm. Um, what I would say is there are folks from all sorts of different backgrounds that are a part of this, and what unifies us is our blackness. So even if we come from different faith traditions, we all know that our faith traditions call for unity and liberation for our people. So regardless of, you know, what God we happen to worship, um, whether some of us see it as the same God or not, um, we all recognize that justice is sort of about the, liber the, the restoration of relationships between humanity. And so... But starting with, as you put it, right, the unity among blacks first, and then the connections. Yeah, sure. And I mean, this can this can be happening. Why is that so important? Why is there important? I think it's important for the audience to understand that. Well, it's important. It's central to the movement. It's important. Okay, so this is a black-centered movement. Exactly. So black people are leading, um, and it's important for us to have self-determination, where we're able to determine our own destinies. And this show is called Radical Imagination. Exactly. And so I believe that we ought and we will have the opportunity to live out our imaginations right here and right now. 
So whatever it is that I dream, I need to be operating today, right now, in this moment, as if the world that I believe is going, that we're going to fight to achieve, I'm going to be operating as if that world already exists. Interesting. Yeah. And that's what you were talking about too, Robbie, right? Weren't you? Yeah, in terms bit. of like the, how, how do you orient yourself within as, the world. As a white uh, progressive, perhaps. In, yeah, in and yeah. Well, yeah, I mean, the conscious is I think, but, but yeah, yeah, but I think the term progressive is, is, is problematic, right? Because I think we talk Tell about us, white yeah. privilege, right? That's become okay. something that people, people understand, people get at. People, like, people who consider them white progressive can say, oh, I know what white privilege is and I can tell you about it. But there's something that we've externalized it, right? Like we're, we're, we're the ability to look at it as something outside of ourselves and study it academically. Right, that's not productive necessarily because there because there isn't that kind of internal gaze and saying like how can I, how do I need to orient myself and place myself in the world such that I'm living the way I'm living in a way that recognizes my privilege versus mm -hmm. just studying it. So that's a major radical transformation. Right, and the, and the, and that, that needs to, to happen. Yeah, and that twice, to me is right. the problem with with Brando's statement. Right, like I think that gets at what the problem is that he hasn't necessarily done that. So I think as a white person who's trying to be involved in the movement. Which you are. Yeah. Okay. And, but, but I think that every, every decision that, I mean, you, I think there, there's, you have to adopt this kind of hypercritical stance. Mm. Because it, if we're talking about a system, it's so ingrained in everything we do that it's kind of like in like the matrix, like you have this blue pill IV drip. Right, yeah. you got to you got to find a way to not to, to take out to not be on the blue pill, you know, take the red pill. How can you do that? Yeah. Right. Right? right. Let me ask a, a little personal question. Go How ahead. did you come to this point of your life where you are, as you say, so hypercritical? Um, I mean, is that, is that something important for all of us to understand? Particularly yeah, whites, not, of course. But it, it, it's hyper. I mean, hypercritical in terms of like, how do you? How can I be, I mean, in order to shed certain things, you have to be, right? So but it's not necessarily- How did you, personally, do How did that? I get- Come to this point, yeah, I think it's- I don't know. Um, I, I think that it's like early on in my life, I kind of had to deal with a lot of, a lot of different trauma, right? I was kind of forced upon me. And at the okay. same time, you're hold, I'm holding this, this stuff that's kind of calling into question as like a kid, um, my own existence, right? And I'm not mm. able to comprehend that, right? But it's there. Right. And then I'm holding that at the same time with, you know, my best friend in the world at that time, uh, you know, grew up in the South Bronx and he was going through similar traumas. Right. right? And, then, and then I don't know, I feel like if you're going to hold the, like if you got to hold those things together, and it, it forces you to orient yourself in a way that kind of gets, tries to get underneath certain things that have been constructed on top of you. Does that make, I don't know if that makes any sense. Well, it, it, it does, it Very does. Much. It's interesting, interesting. Um, so, Kosi, uh, where do you see Black Lives Matter movement heading? Where would you like to see it head? Mm -hmm. um, you know, from the legacy of the Panthers, other liberation, black national movements. What is the vision, do you think? Or is it, is it still emerging, as you're saying, Carmen? Uh, remains to be seen how this all develops, or what would you like to see happen? Right, right. So as someone who's not aligned with a specific chapter, but is more in you know, solidarity with and supporting, and again, doing whatever work I do under that kind of large umbrella of Black Lives Matter, I mean, I think first I just want to acknowledge what has been done, which is very positive. Uh, the conversation about race in this country has changed. Uh, there's still a lot of more work to do, but these issues have been brought to the fore and folks are wrestling and engaging them. Uh, and we need to acknowledge that and recognize that. In terms of going forward, um, well, you know, I look back at Occupy and I think Occupy was great, and again, kind of generating awareness around issues of class, around issues of corporate rule, and so mm -hmm. on and so forth, 99%, 1%. I think one of the limits with Occupy, though, was that they were unable to come around a set of demands to say, okay, now that we've generated all this awareness, right. where do we go with this power? 
what demands the do we make the organization, on power? Where is this all going? Exactly. And so I think as um, Black Lives Matter continues to move forward as a movement and as individual chapters, um, I would like to continue to see, uh, and you could probably speak to this uh, better, um, with this kind of energy and, and, and power that's being generated, uh, make certain demands, further demands on power. Mm -hmm. um, not mm -hmm. just say, uh, hey, politician, we want you to hear, say that Black Lives Matter, which is very important. Again, it's bringing that awareness, but saying, okay, well, if you truly believe that Black Lives Matter, how does that reflect in your policy mm -hmm. and bring pressure to bear on politicians in power that way? Um, and so I'd like to see some of that percolate uh, going forward. Um, I have so much to say about this. Uh, I do want to also, before we move any further, I want to make clear the uh, distinction between, and you touched on this, the, make clear the distinction between uh, the Black Lives Matter network with the 26 chapters and the, the o sort of overarching movement um, that yeah. the media has termed uh, Black Lives Matter. Sort of internally, we call it the movement for black lives. So oftentimes you'll hear people saying Black Lives Matter and they're sort of talking about the overall movement but not necessarily uh, the 26 chapters or kind of meshing those two together. And they're, they're, they're connected but they're very distinct. Um, and so the, the, the overall movement is comprised. It's the decentralized movement that's... Make, yeah, make that distinction yeah, for us. That's so a, the overall movement, which is very decentralized, is right. comprised of... Uh, anyone, I often call it the get in where you fit in movement. So anyone mm. who wants to make an impact uh, has an entry point. Uh, I was brought in from the, what I would call the periphery. And um, so you have, might have different organizations. You might have an organization like uh, the Black Youth Project. What's the periphery? Uh, so I would say the periphery <laughs> is, uh, imagine like a, a, a molecule or something. Uh, and within the, within, within the network um, are these different like molecules. And so okay. they make up the network. But on the outside of that network is the periphery, folks who have not yet been brought in or who have not yet brought themselves in or connected. And okay. so, yeah, there are always nice. like these entry points where people can either be brought in or people can make way for themselves to become a part of the decentralized movement. And we've seen that happen uh, where folks who just saw a need and had a desire and a passion to do something and sort of stepped in and got it done. So social media is, is the big... Yeah, social media uh, has, has the, one example uh, is the collective yeah. call Millions March here in New York City. So you had uh, a couple of young women who wanted to, to mobilize folks really quickly and were able to do that via social media. And now they're sort of known as the group that can really mobilize people very quickly. Mm -hmm. But we all work together. So we're not necessarily in a part of the same organization. Imagine like gears moving okay. to move um, a device. So all of us are working at the same time. It's different moving parts happening at the same time, still a but we're moving though. the body, we're moving right. the machine, we're still a collective all together. How do decisions get made? Uh, so it just varies uh, depending on um, your network. Uh, I'll give you an example. Um, so we actually have the chapter, uh, the network with the 26 chapters, we actually have uh, a set of protocols um, around, say, um, some of the uh, uh, elected uh, candidate disruptions. Uh -huh. and, but at, simultaneously, we do have a set of protocols around that. But oftentimes, the response for that has to happen very quickly. Uh, some of these actions that you're seeing out on, on TV um, happened within the blink of, you know, a day, a day or so notice. Someone made that decision. Yeah, folks. And then there was a reflection on it, or and then perhaps that strategy was well, good, not good. Well, there are local chapters. So okay. a lot of what you see, if you want to if you want to know what's going on with Black Lives Matter in terms of policy and the impact that's happening on the ground, because um, a lot of times people think we're just being responsive. We're just responding to things that are happening and not really recognizing that on the local level, there's a lot going on. So if you want to know what's happening policy-wise, um, 
it's really important to look locally. For example, here in New York City, our chapter uh, recently uh, developed, last year developed, well, this year, beginning of this year, developed a campaign called Safety Beyond Policing, which uh, really wanted to stop the uh, city council from bringing on, spending over $100 million, mm. bringing on uh, over 1,000 officers, because we're recognizing that safety in our communities does not look like more police. It actually looks like us having our needs met. So. We're in a place now where uh, jobs for youth programs are severely underfunded. Um, obviously, people are having trouble, like, with transportation, um, mental health services. Uh, folks with mental health issues are being criminalized. Homeless folks are being criminalized for not having housing. Um, and so that's where we see the, 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 the city needs, needed to make the investment. Um, but um, unfortunately, the city did bring on uh, about 1,300 cops. So we are continuing that campaign. So that's one of the so things that's happening. Survival campaign, as <coughs> perhaps Huey Newton was referring to, breakfast programs or social agencies. Uh, yeah, so, and we're, at, we're also developing <coughs> uh, some political education okay. uh, courses for so. local communities. Um, but we really like... Um, Hugh Newton spoke of, we really believe in more than surviving. And so the overarching goal, I think, of this movement is uh, to see black people thriving in this country, where we have self-determination, where we can determine our own uh, destiny. Uh, that is up to us as a community to do, and that's what we want. We want black liberation, and we see policy as a means to get there. We don't see policy as the end goal. Um, I recently came back from a conference with uh, policymakers and movement people, and some of, the, some of the folks in the room actually lived through, we did a couple of case studies, and some of the folks in the room actually lived through some of the, the case studies, um, and one of them was the black uh, power movement. And the one thing that they said was, we don't really think policy, and this is policy makers, right. uh, we don't mm -hmm. really believe that policy changed, you know, policy really didn't change anything. What it did was change the narrative. It shifted the narrative. And policy was a bridge to get us further down the line. So when you see uh, the images of, you know, black mm. women or black folks with their hair out, um, wearing their afros and their natural hair, um, the point was that the culture, the culture is what changed. The culture is right. what, um, the policy was able to change the narrative um, so that the culture began to shift. Okay, and yeah. what about some of the, let's say, economic issues? Uh, Self-determination, realizing that capitalism, yeah, so uh, I, or, or perhaps black capitalism, well, uh, is, is a, is a... What do you mean when you say black well, capitalism? Um, black control over the capital that is produced uh, within the community. If that becomes part of the narrative and the majority uh, agree, that, you know, the self-determination then takes that form, would that be something that you would advocate? Well, I guess I, I probably have a bit of a different definition of capitalism. Okay. I... Um, I see capitalism as an abusive uh, force. I do too. Yeah. I'm just I'm just curious as to what policies, economic policies, flow from uh, the self determination that you're talking okay. about. Okay, so uh, there there are some economic policies that are out there, but um, what what our chapter actually is is in the process of doing is uh, crowdsourcing, you know, policies because we don't believe in determining policies without. Uh, the people who are most deeply impacted by those policies okay. uh, being at the table. So we're not going to go out and, su and, and suggest uh, that this is the answer uh, without our people. So we have to spend the time. We're organizers. Many of us are, like, <coughs> trained organizers. Um, and we, we believe in spending the time to build relationships with our people and having conversations with our people about what they want. And then mm -hmm. we fight together. We Understood. build a base um, and we build power that way and we go after what we want together as a community. It's not one group or a few people doing it for our people, it's all of our people doing it together. And exactly. that's how we will win. Exactly. And, and yeah. Can I just jump in on that? Sure, I'm, sure. I'm so good to hear you say that. I mean, going back to the Panthers, I think I think that was one of the strengths of yep. their movement. You mm -hmm. know, So they had a, a political philosophy, they had a kind of 
national kind of understanding and international perspective, but they also were very deeply local and embedded amongst the people. Um, and so it's good to hear that, that that's uh, kind of a similar philosophy that, that's guiding the local chapter, at least here in mm -hmm. New York. I, I think that's right on. Yeah. Yeah. Did you all, now you, you two were involved in uh, Rise of October. Uh, mass incarceration, closing down Rikers Island and, and so on. Now, was that something that you became concerned with? How did you, did you, did your organization, you're on the uh, steering committee, for example, and you've been active also organizing it. Um, how did you uh, reach out, or would you have um, reached out to the local chapter here right, and get, right. get them to, to uh, at least listen to what you're doing Right, right. Was that? Sure. So we made it very clear from the beginning of our campaign. Um, I know this because I actually said this at our kickoff event in late August at First Corinthian Baptist Church, that we understood Rise Up October as just one effort amongst many that are trying to um, stop police terror, you know, value black lives, and so on and so forth. Uh, and with that comes this reaching out to other groups to say, hey, um, let's work together. So that's literally what I said, mm -hmm. uh, and that's literally what we are about. Um, but with any movement and in any uh, campaign, you know, lots of times so things don't, do. you know, exactly. So. Uh, oh, I, just, I just want to say, please, please, um, yeah, please. Yeah. We, so we, some of our folks actually were a part um, mm -hmm. yeah. of conversations um, around Rise Up October mm -hmm. from exactly. the local chapter. Mm -hmm. So there was the connection definitely exactly. did happen yeah. um, from, what mm -hmm. I, from what I recall from last right, year. Right, yeah. right, right. Exactly. Yeah. So exactly, <laughs> yeah. exactly. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Um, I think going forward, that's another step that can be taken. I mean, how do we connect with one another? Mm -hmm. um, really, that's a step that the left needs to do. How do we come together? Um, how do we connect our various movements? Because uh, that's the only way we're going to, to the really... The organizations, <laughs> the associations, right, the right. different backgrounds. Right, so. right. You know, I mean, we, we need Absolutely. broad coalitions. I mean, take a look at uh, <clears throat> what happened at the University of Missouri. Right. One. You know, I mean, maybe we'll get to that later. But get to it. Let's get um, to it right, right. now. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, no, so, it's an incredible right. coalition. Right, it's incredible coalition. Yeah. You That's had brilliant. labor, one. right? That one. Exactly. Um, and the divisions coalition. within the campus mm -hmm. uh, disappeared. They right. saw. Right. Now, why did that happen? Right, right. Do you think? I mean, th we need m much right. more of that, don't right. we? We do. We do. Imagine a left that can bring itself together. Exactly. Uh, and rather than as Fred Hampton was talking about. Dividing, right, right. constantly divided. Exactly. Um, and I'm not sure if the divisions disappeared. I mean, there right. are students like currently under threat right exactly. now. Um, exactly. You know, uh, threatened not to come to class because white terrorists, white supremacists were going to kill them. So the division is still there, but um, the movement is building there. We mm -hmm. see, uh, based on what happened at Mizzou, that what can happen with organizing. And so it started here, and then right. uh, different groups within within the, the the campus network got involved, and that that there was a groundswell, and that grew to something, and they were able to get a demand met. So having the president and the chancellor resign clearly is not the goal. They've stated that, but it's a demand, and it's a it's it's a start. And they're going somewhere. They've taken off. They have momentum now, and they're moving. And the and the backlash is there. Yeah, the backlash is the a part. Yeah. yeah. So um, you obviously, I, have to be prepared for that. Yeah. Right. And um, folks are working. Expecting that. Yeah, and folks are working through that. But uh, that is a part of the struggle. That is a part of the struggle for Black liberation. And um, yeah. Do you work with? white groups that are interested in some sort of coalition of transformation? Are uh, they, you know, yeah. if, if, if you see that they're willing and able to begin to have a change of heart? Well, um, the... Is that a possibility down the road? Sort perhaps? of the, the, the white hmm. folks that uh, we work with, we don't have to tell them what to do. 
they know what to do. We don't have to educate them, and that's not something we're interested in doing. We don't see that as our responsibility. It's not our responsibility as black people uh, to educate white people on what white supremacy has done to us. We see that as the role of white folks. So what Marlon Brando did mention uh, in the clip was that he wanted to, he needed to go talk to more white people. Right. So that's sort of the role that we see white people uh, needing to have in this movement is it was white folks who built up this oppressive system. It needs to be them working to topple, to bring it down. Um, and so with that said, though, um, with um, white individuals and groups that we have existing, pre-existing relationships with, um, they are able to come to us and say, you know, we have these resources. Um, how would you like for us to, to divvy up these resources for you. So it's not us having to tell them what to do because they want to. They want the satisfaction of feeling like they have a role to play. Um, that's, they come to that awareness that this is. They've already done that work. They've so done that work, right. undoing so. white privilege is work for white people. And if anybody's coming to me, they need to have already have done that work. That's not work for me. That's I don't see that as work for me or um or Hillary black needs folks some more work do. though. She needs a lot of work. That, that <laughs> confrontation. Yeah, uh, she's not there yet. She needs a lot of work. She's doing Bernie, a lot of tokenizing. To, Bernie not as much? Bernie needs work too. Work too, but not yeah. maybe as much. Well, I don't know. Um okay. just because you mm -hmm. march with King, you know. Uh, doesn't mean that you're on the ball now, okay. and what's going on with uh, black folks in, in, you know, in Vermont? So, okay. you know that right. what Ben well, Carson needs some work. Well, you, you know, so? <laughs> <laughs> you know <laughs> I, know. I think all right, these, right. All these all, people are pretty obvious. Lot, we all, yeah. yeah, pretty obvious. So yeah. it's it's a lot of work to do, and and as you were saying, Cosi, how do we? Build that as part of the left because this the left have always been you know factionalized and, and at each other's throats and mm -hmm. who's the purest of the purest and and uh, who's the more Marxist and, and so on and we won't get into that yeah. with yeah. Uh, although we certainly could as you know uh, with with Rise of October mm -hmm. and and where does the left and, and, and you know the progressive left uh, how can it begin to Really dialogue in the way that you're talking about. Mm -hmm. Go beyond itself mm -hmm. um, and make those connections that are so necessary. Mm -hmm. No, I just think that yeah, there's, yeah, there's one there's thing that, you know, on this, in terms yeah. of the aggressive stance taken by some people on the left, in terms of when it comes to issues of race, is right. really complicated. Yeah. Because there's this ten I feel like there's a tendency to be preaching to the choir, right? Like and I understand, and so saying, being very aggressive about your stance on racial issues doesn't necessarily create allies when you're directing it at someone who's had to live through it. If that makes it, I think there, it, it's right. hard to create this kind of true alliance yeah, when yeah, you yeah, as somebody good. who's not been through something right, right. is so aggressive about it to be. people who have to live it that I think that, that creates this barrier. Absolutely. And so I think that's another thing to be really, really aware of. Absolutely. And, and we are running fast out of time here. We just uh, we could do 14 different shows on yeah. this. Yeah. Uh, and we need to do another one at least. And, and so I want to thank you so much. Thank you. This has been really exciting, enlightening. Uh, and I'm, I'm so thankful. And you know, our audience is so grateful for you to, for, for your shedding uh, you know, some information and, and the humanity of, of what you're trying to do here. So, the Black Lives Matter movement represents a continuation of a dialogue addressed to a new generation of young people struggling to remain hopeful and idealistic. They face a country of overwhelming cynicism, spiritual indifference, and a numbing spiritual blackout. And they face the pessimism of sentimentalism a wringing of hands and crocodile tears with no follow-through by an increasing army of passive spectators. As they move forward with a vision, integrity, courage, and hope, rooted in a tradition of what Cornell West calls people of a blues tradition, they search for a radical love 
that can, sustain, that can sustain them and us in the face of the failures, lies, distortions, denials, and rationalizations of the so-called American dream. Their dream of turning around what has come to be an American nightmare for great numbers of people of color and the great masses of people in the country and around the world should have the support of people of goodwill of whatever color or background. The Black Lives Matter movement could be that vanguard the Panthers talked about, a spark that can liberate us all as we struggle to bring about a more progressive and humane world through the radical imagination. Thank you so much, Kosi, Carmen, and Robbie, for your courage, love, and humanity. And thank you all so much for watching our show. This is your host, Jim Vretos, and we'll see you next week as we pursue the radical imagination.